Hey, hey everyone, back again. Today we're gonna to talk about Felix Guattari's Everybody Wants to Be a Fascist. Now before jumping into it, if you wanna follow me anywhere other than on here, you can find me uh, on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy, on Twitter, which is just my name, at David Guignol. Uh, if you're listening to this in podcast form, you'll be able to find the video for this episode on YouTube if you're into that, where I also release other videos uh, if you're into, into that at all. If you're listening to this, if you found this on YouTube, you'll be able to find it in podcast form where there shouldn't be any ads, which is obviously better. If you're new here, welcome, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to help you along your philosophical journey. So if you're new, subscribe, leave a comment, like, share, tell your friends. Uh, that, that would help me out a lot. If you wanna help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. If you're listening to this in podcast form on probably just Apple Podcasts, you could leave a review, it would help me out, and uh, five stars would obviously be great. And yeah, I don't waste any more of your time with that. Let's talk about Guattari's text here. Everybody wants to be a fascist. So he's discussing fascism because it's a real problem. It's not some nebulous speculative thing that doesn't have any effect in the real world. He was writing at a time, I think this was in the early 70s or so, but anyway, in that kind of historical period, coming out of World War II, when we saw the fascisms, uh, Stalinist fascism, German fascism, Italian fascism, American fascism, we saw all these fascisms ostensibly go away, right? But to Guattari, their spirit is still very much alive. And so this text is a way for him to describe how they, they're continuing and how they are, the, the logic of fascism is found in each of us and how we are very much, while predisposed might be kind of a, an extreme way to put it, we have a kind of propensity to fall for the trick of fascism. And so we have to be very careful. We have to be very much prepared to not do that. So in order for an analysis of fascism to proceed, it must acknowledge its reality, as I've kind of already said. So what that means is engaging with it both, both in a kind of abstract way, that is a macroscopic way, looking at it broadly and looking at it more specifically in its microscopic uh, kind of manifestations or looking at it microscopically. And he says that other approaches like psychoanalysis and Marxism are ill-equipped to do this because they are too quick to look at the broad, the kind of macroscopic uh, elements of fascism rather than on the microscopic ones as well. Now for more on this, you have to really check out Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus where he and Deleuze really get into that uh, problem a lot, or at least in how they try to sketch a framework that is different than what psychoanalysis and in some cases what Marxism offers. Now I, f I frame it in that way because they are mostly concerned and Guattari here is mostly concerned with psychoanalysis. He's totally dissatisfied with what psychoanalysis provides in terms of understanding the movements of fascism. Because psychoanalysis wants to think about fascism in terms of satisfying a lack, sa satisfying something that people desire. So moves into the picture because it claims to offer what the masses need, which is true in part, but it hinges upon a very narrow understanding of desire. So Deleuze and Guattari do, and what Guattari just does in this text, is demonstrate that desire doesn't really have anything to do with a lack. Rather, desire is the demonstration of a, uh, the, the formation of connections. Now these connections happen on every single level. If I, for example, drink a cup of water, what is happening is there is a connection being formed between what they would call the mouth machine to the cup machine, which allows the flowing of the water machine into my mouth and then helps me uh, keep going as a human. Now, the only way that that is possible is because as well, you know, you have your finger machines holding the cup and your eye machines coordinating you and so on. Now in that given moment, you are enacting and each one of those components, each one of those machines is enacting a kind of desiring. They are desiring that action. But in doing so, they are foreclosing they're doing another action. So for example, if I am occupied with the cup machine in my hand, that means I can't be 
I don't know, working with the baseball bat machine, if that's just one, you know, one possible thing. So in doing that, I experience some degree of lack, but it's a lack that happens not in a broad way where you lack a kind of abstract desire, or in the case of psychoanalysis, women experience a lack in that they do not have uh, a penis, you know, these very broad things. So Deleuze and Guattari want to think about it in terms of rather very microscopic notions of lacking. Now, it's in this way that he, Guattari, paints fascism to be as effective as it is, because it doesn't tap into a broad form of an idea of lack, like uh, psychoanalysis would have it. It also seeps into these very microscopic forms of lack that happen between any two given little machines. So fascism taps into this because of its adaptive capacity. It is able to speak to the bureaucrats. It is able to speak to the laborers. It is able to speak to the artisans. It is able to speak to the shop owners in ways that just totalitarianism is ill-equipped to do. And this is how Deleuze and Guattari, or in this case just Guattari here, draws a parallel between capitalist fascism and kind of fascism as we can historically conceive of it, because it is able to speak to people on an individual level in order to make them feel like they are being heard in their specific wants and specific needs, in their specific uh, notions of lack. That is what, in their specific lives, they are missing, not broad things like they are just lacking, like uh, access to uh, power or you know, lacking or experiencing or being threatened with a kind of castration in very broad way. It doesn't appeal to people in that way. It appeals to people in very specific ways. Now, I believe it was, uh, I think it was Gary Janosko, who's, um, you know, he's a scholar, a Canadian scholar who has written about Baudillard and, and Guattari. He, he has an essay about this. Uh, I think it's only in French uh, in which he discusses how Trump relates to what Guattari was writing here, which is super interesting. You can find it online if you're curious. So he likens this approach, this kind of anti-fascist approach, to what he first saw at the beginning of the May 68 uh, student revolts and, and supposed, maybe not supposed, but kind of failed revolution in France, which, fun fact, at that time, he and Baudillard were writing together for some French journal. It may have been Le Monde, or uh, oh, it could have been something smaller than that. Anyways, they were they were friends and they were writing together, especially on this uh, at that period. So he locates a kind of uh, possible, you know, revolutionary impetus in that movement, in that moment in May '68, in which there was not just an attempt to galvanize a single kind of group identity in response to fascism or fascist fascist tendencies, but it was about also recognizing that. Fascism seeps into people's lives in very specific ways, and that to overcome that doesn't mean, uh, I guess, transposing it with another broad meta narrative type uh, identity structure that would just, you know, invariably regress into a kind of totalitarianism. It was instead about recognizing people's different positions in society, and some of the ways that he frames that is in terms of like class, gender, uh, race. Now these different people are affected differently by fascist systems. So it's not about just replicating the logic of fascism by appealing to these differences. It is instead recognizing that people experience the world differently and that's totally fine. And that there is therefore the risk that just because a system is able to speak your specific language or appeal to you in a specific, in a specific way, doesn't mean that it, it doesn't have this nefarious agenda. Now what coheres them in, in terms of like possible political action is their mutual recognition of a desire that is separate, that is their own, yet it is still a recognition of an, a, a kind of disposition for toward desire, toward experiencing these modes of of kind of connections that I sketched earlier in every single one of our lives at every single point that is not reducible to you know these broad these broad movements and these broad kind of political uh, efforts. So the Marxist idea about the working class in pretty broad terms is kind of 
not very satisfactory for Guattari. It's just way too reductive. It doesn't, it doesn't take people in their own terms. So it is only when we can recognize these implicit differences, these specificities, that we can begin to be wary or vigilant of the way that fascism is going to appropriate those specificities for its own use. And he kind of muses that perhaps this is why the United States was so late to jump into the war effort in World War II was because they, or the kind of capitalism that they represented, very much recognized itself in the way that Hitler was mobilizing his fascism. He was speaking to the people in terms of their uh, specific wants and desires, very much like the capitalist enterprise tends to do. It He made kind of uh, d demonstrative appeals to the military without directly uh, or he, he didn't appoint or he wasn't a kind of military person but he was still firmly attached to the military. Now the reason that that is attached to capitalism is that capitalism always tries to convince us that we are not you know secretly under the control of the military like the market just regulates itself like these global oil futures are just they just kind of uh, work themselves out via the free market as though there isn't a huge military apparatus that keeps, uh, that forms the kind of bedrock of capitalist global exploitation. But it's always, it's kind of kept, uh, made hidden in the whole kind of soup of it all. Now, while Germany very much wanted to display its military might, at the same time, Hitler's role was not as a kind of military person per se but he had those connections and he was he did have that history even though he wanted to speak to the people not in terms of military might per se but in terms of their individual needs and wants so why then did the u.s finally step in well it went too far for capitalism and he's just talking about this quite um, abstractly even a little ironically to some extent he i don't think he actually thinks that this was the reason but he thinks that if there was this similarity he, or these similarities between capitalism and between German fascism, that the reason that finally capitalism, as it was kind of embodied by America, as it began not to see itself in Germany at the point when it became kind of collective death instinct on the part of the German military and the, the bureaucracy where they kind of gave up and the masses were almost just predisposed towards death, like it was either victory or death. Now that's not effective, that's not very productive for the capitalist economy, and so it was at that point that it could say, okay, we can step in now, because these aren't actually our secret allies in all of this. So we have these kind of three broad forms of fascism. We have uh, German fascism, Stalinism, and American fascism in the form of capitalism, where German fascism, according to Guattari, kind of ate itself. It, it, it cannibalized itself. Stalin fascism was just totally geared towards military rule, so it avoided that kind of possible uh, self-immolation, which capitalism didn't really jive with because then that, that doesn't allow people to have the sense of their being atomized, of their being individualized for their own effort, working for their own uh, desires. Of course, it was too overtly repressive. But capitalism is the most effective for Guattari because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't impose an overt control over people. It instead hides that control, makes it think that it's their own, when in fact it is just these kind of micro-fascism seeping in in order to maintain uh, a degree of control under the guise of a kind of freedom. Now we need what Guattari gives us in order to recognize these micro demonstrations, these kind of tentacles of fascism that seep into specific communities, specific individuals, you know, the broader public in general, in order to impose these beliefs upon them. And yeah, that's pretty well it. Uh, if, you know, I did anything wrong, if there's something I should have mentioned that I didn't, I'd love to hear about it. But really, I should stress, go and read anti Oedipus or A Thousand Plateaus for more on this, or I've done episodes covering all of them if you want that instead. Uh, but yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, tell your friends, leave five stars would help me out a lot, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.